Thank you. Thank you. Put the red button on. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, declare the meeting open. And four members of the following members will be joining by the meeting through teleconferencing. Unfortunately, not Gemma has uh, apologised. And can we formally record her apologies? Uh, a clerk, please. I can ensure our electronic devices are switched to mute. I went speaking to ensure quality of sound recording. Uh, recorded the apologies from uh, Gemma Dolan. That's been done. Uh, no further apologies. Uh, members, any interest to declare? Well, the item on my bill. Yeah. Uh, Jim, after declaring an interest on it. Bill. If we move to the draft minutes of proceedings for the 22nd of April 2020, uh, the draft minutes of the meeting are on page four. Members, are you content with the draft minutes? Our accurate record of proceedings. All those in favour say aye. aye. Happy for us to publish on the website. Agreed. Uh, matters arising joint order of PPE between Department of Finance and the Irish Government. I would like to remind the members of the meeting on the 22nd of April that the committee considered the response from the Minister regarding the joint order for PPE between the Department of Foreign Finance and the Irish Government. It was agreed to delay any decision until the committee could see and agree a draft letter on the proposal at this week's meeting. I draw members' attention to a draft letter from the Minister tabled at page 3 and three written responses received from members in relation to the letter which are tabled at pages 4, 5 and 6. Any comments from the members? Okay. Uh, if we have that, then can I have your agreement to finalise the letter and forward to the Minister to seek clarity on the issues raised? All those in favour say aye. 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 Those against? No. No. Against. Uh, is it Gemma giving you one of your votes? Gemma giving one of you two your votes? Yeah. Uh, and uh, Gemma is of the same opinion. Yes, she sent a letter as well, too. So the proposal is to forward the letter to the Minister? The proposal is, yeah. And, uh, and three members. Uh, so I, just, uh, I pointed out uh, to you, Jim, just that um, uh, it was a majority decision within this committee to forward that letter and that it doesn't have our approval. And that I felt it was reflective of the uh, witch hunting uh, part of the minister as well, too. Yeah, and we've, you're noted on that's on the record as well. Thank you. Uh, next item review of legislative consent motions. Remind members of the meeting on the 22nd of April the committee considered this matter. A draft response to the Committee on Procedures is tabled at page 7. Members, are we content with the response? All those in favour say aye, and we are happy to forward that to the Committee on Procedures. Agreed? Agreed. Okay. Uh, Northern Ireland Courts and Tribunal Service offers to engage with CPD. The four members included in table papers at page 9 is a response from CPD accepting the offer to engage with the Northern NI NICTS and confirming that CPD will keep the Committee informed of progress. I would like your agreement to note. All those agreed say aye. Right. Thank you very much indeed. And we can start the oral evidence. So these are two different sessions of oral evidence, right? Yeah. There's a fair bit of overlap, isn't there? Welcome, member. Welcome. Come on in. Okay, I would like to remind the members that this uh, agenda item has been recorded by Hansard. I'd like to remind members on the 25th of April 2020, members were asked to forward the Minister's letter with regards to the need for additional vote on account to raise for inclusion in the overview briefing paper on the budget. You're not quite hear me. It's unusual for me. And the following members agreed, myself, uh, the Deputy Jim, Jim Allister, Gemma and Pat. I'd like to seek your formal agreement for the purpose of recording in the minutes to forward the Minister's letter regarding the need for additional vote on account to raise for inclusion in its overview, v overview briefing paper on the budget. All those in favour say aye. 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 I would like to welcome, now hopefully this is going to work, I would like to welcome Jeff, Barry and Joanne. Joanne, can you hear us? Yes. I would like to welcome Jeff and Barry on that occasion. <laughs> I was working far too smoothly beforehand. I'd like to draw members' attention to the following papers relating to this agenda item. Oh, that should be. Joanne? Yes. 
Can you hear us? I can, yes. Excellent. Welcome to, welcome to the meeting by teleconference. Understood. I've already introduced Jeff and Barry, but for, formally for the record, uh, Jeff uh, McGuinness is Head of Central Expenditure Division for the Department of Finance. Uh, Joanne McBurney is Budget Director, Department of Finance, and Barry Armstrong is Supply Officer from the Department of Finance. I draw members' attention to the following papers related to this agenda item. The Clark's Brief on page 16. Tabled at page 11 is Clark's paper with suggested lines for questioning relating to the Minister's budget statement. Departmental Briefing Budget 2021 and COVID-19 at page 20. Department's response to committee's budget queries on page 27. Minister's letter regarding budget number two bill, page 30. Tabled at page 12 is the Minister's budget statement. Tabled at page 28 is the raised briefing document to support coordinated budget scrutiny. The paper contains a number of scrutiny points, some of which members may wish to raise with the department. The return budget templates for 2021 received from the following committees. Uh, Agriculture, Communities, Education, the Executive Office, Finance, Health, Infrastructure, Justice and Audit, and those are from page 33 to page 218. And the Department for the Economy's template is tabled at page 96. Uh, Jeff, can I ask you to make an opening statement? Thank sure. you. Uh, in terms of overview of Budget 2021, uh, the context of the budget is that it's a single-year budget. Um, it's driven, that timetable is driven by Treasury. Treasury set the UK budget for a number of years in advance at each spending review, and devolved administrations are constrained to setting their budgets to the same or less period. Um, so currently the UK has no budget in place beyond 2021, hence why we have a single year budget. The executive budget can only include funding which was set out in the Minister's statement to the Assembly on the 16th of March. This is due to the Stormont Agreement and Implementation Plan Amendment to the Northern Ireland Act, stipulating that an Assembly statement has to be made following um, Secretary of State confirmation of the budget envelope, and a budget cannot be put in place less than 14 days after that Assembly statement. The delay of the Chancellor's UK budget to the 11th of March meant that our budget was announced much later than we would have preferred. Um, the budget only included £120 million of COVID-19 funding. The majority of the COVID-19 response will be dealt, dealt with separately to the budget. It, it was a challenging public expenditure environment, even without COVID-19. Uh, the new decade, new approach raised expectations, but funding was not available for all the priorities. Uh, in terms of resource deal, um, for funding available for allocation, including new decade, new approach funding, and excluding the £120 million provided for COVID-19, there was £965.8 million available for allocation above baseline. The New Decade New Approach financial package provided £350 million for immediate budgetary pressures, £85 million for pay parity for Agenda for Change staff, £44 million for public sector transformation funding, and £4 million for Northern Ireland unique circumstances. In terms of rates, the Executive agreed that regional rate would be frozen for domestic customers and non-domestic business would see a £4p in the pound reduction, uh, reducing rates income by approximately £56 million, and that is effectively funded by the Executive. Those costs have been met from within existing Dell budgets in the proposed outcome and have not used additional COVID-19 Barnett consequentials. Uh, in terms of uh, COVID-19 measures proposed for rates, there was a three-month rates holiday for businesses and a delay in bills until June. The cost of approximately £100 million for the three-month holiday will be met from the first £120 million of Barnet received in respect of the COVID-19 response, and there is no associated cost with delaying the bills. In terms of allocations, um, over and above the rule forward baselines, there are a number of pre-commitments. Um, there was £9.8 million for independent bodies, for the likes of the Audit Office, the Assembly Commission and the Public Services Ombudsman. And those those um, bodies have their budgets. They're not um, defined by the executive. They are set by committees here in Stormont, um, and uh, with, with a, an input from the Department of Finance in terms of the overall financial picture. But once those budgets are set, um, it's the executive should um, is committed to funding those budgets. Hence, why it was a pre-commitment. Uh, there was a further 48.7 million in relation to staff costs for EU exit including vets and police officers. Um, those were rolled forward costs from 
um, hiring people for EU exit related posts last year. And the, the final sort of area of pre-commitments was 29.7 million of ring fence funding for national security, and that went to DOJ. Uh, in terms of allocations for a new decade, new approach, uh, there was an agenda for change pay, which was a total cost of 160 million. 85 million pounds of that was met from the, the new decade, new approach financial package, and 75 million pounds of that was met from the executive's general funds. There was um, on new decade, new approach. There was a transformation. There was 44 million pounds allocated to health. Uh, for specific allocations, um, in terms of executive commitments, there were two executive commitments that were met. Um, one of which was five million pounds for the Department of Health for safe staffing. And another one, the other one was £23 million to the Department for Communities for the bedroom tax mitigation. Other specific allocations included £37 million to the Department of Health for the balance of inescapable transformation costs, £17.3 million to the Department for Communities in relation to the balance of costs for other welfare mitigations and community support, including benefit cap and social supermarkets. £1.5 million um, was allocated to the Department for Communities for welfare advice centres. One million was allocated to the Department of Health in relation to the contaminated blood um, scandal. Three point three million was allocated to the Department for Communities for a D rating grant, an increase to the D rating grant. One point two million was allocated to the Department for Communities for housing benefit support. Five million was allocated to the Department for Justice, Department of Justice in respect of legacy costs. Thirty seven and a half million was allocated to the Executive Office for Historical Institutional Abuse Payments. £20 million was allocated to DFI, the uh, Department for Infrastructure, to address the ongoing TransLink deficit. Mm -hmm. £42 million was allocated to the Department for Education for special educational needs. And £19 million was allocated to um, the Department for Economy for further education lecturers' pay. Um, in terms of general allocations, departments also receive general allocations, which can be used at the discretion of each minister. So while the, in terms of the overall resource outcome, whilst the, it does not cover all the departmental pressures, it does provide real terms increases for all departments. Mm -hmm. Turning to Capital Dale, the capital outcome addresses all inescapable pressures departments have submitted. Uh, it addresses all executive pre-commitments and flagship funding. As well as covering those inescapable pressures, um, it also provides some £847 million of funding for high priority projects, which individual ministers can allocate according to the needs of their own departments. In light of COVID 19, we allow departments time to finalise spending area detail. Uh, we anticipate that that will be available to MLAs tomorrow. Um, there is ongoing flexibility for ministers to reallocate their internal funding, the funding within their own department, and that will be kept under review by the executive. Uh, in terms of COVID-19 response, it's being handled. Oh, sorry, just to go back. Sir, we're me. expecting those updates to come through to raise. You say tomorrow. Uh, we are expecting the the, the publication of the budget um, document to be issued to all MLAs tomorrow. Right. Okay. Uh, that's in advance of Tuesday's debate and vote to give MLAs time to consider. Right. Okay. Um, in terms of the COVID-19 response, being it's being handled separately, but there's a number of obviously there's UK-wide measures um, that people within Northern Ireland can avail of. There was uh, 1,192 million pounds of Barnet allocated to date um, to the executive to respond to the COVID-19 uh, issue. Uh, about 1.1 billion of that has been allocated already, with about uh, approximately 90 million still to allocate by the executive. Sorry, just go back again, sir. That's one 1.19 billion. 1.19 billion allocated to, from Treasury to ourselves, yes. Okay. And that includes the uh, charities mitigation money and also includes yes. the money that came through from the, that was going through to the councils, the Barnet mitigation for that, 50 million for that? There was, yes. Um, so those those were all included that. within that 1.19 so billion. Right, okay. um, ministers have also been asked to reprioritise their funding internally to meet the demands of code within their department. Um, and the funding um, has been dealt with as a separate process will then be factored into a monitoring round later in the financial year. Um, Let's go back to the 1.1 and so that just to go back to when the Chancellor made his revised statement. So that is 1.19 billion in basically four weeks that yes. has been allocated in addition. It's been a 
a dramatic change and an ever evolving situation. Yes, so yeah. that's a, um, that's one, correct. One nine billion in four weeks. Okay. Yeah. Um, finally, um, you'll be aware that uh, the minister has requested a further vote on account to be taken forward to avoid departments running out of cash before the main estimate. And um, Barry may be able to elaborate a little bit on that. Yes, please, Barry. Can I? Yeah. So. Um, the last Budget Act was passed by the Assembly in March and gave approval for the cash and use of resources by departments for the 2019-20 financial year. Uh, it also approved a vote on account to allow departments to continue to draw cash and use resources into the early months of the 2020-21 financial year, pending the Assembly's consideration of the 2020-21 main estimates and associated budget bill. It was anticipated that this would be brought to the Assembly in June, with the intention that it would receive Royal Assent by 31st of July. As is normal, this vote on account was set at approximately 45% of the provision that has been sought for the previous year. At that time, the impact of COVID-19 response could not have been anticipated, and that has meant that some departments have now, are now having to access larger amounts of cash and consume greater levels of resources than was anticipated when the level of the vote on account was being set. There have been and continue to be very significant additional allocations made to departments for the COVID-19 response funded uh, from... Which departments? Uh, the Department for Economy... Department for Health Obviously, yeah. are, 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 are certainly two of the the, 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 the biggest amounts, <coughs> and Department for Communities as well. Right. Um, so all the others are in roughly in line uh, then. The the departments the, the departments that have uh, sort of I'm sorry, apologies, wrong sheet. The the departments that we've identified here, and I say uh, not getting ahead of myself, uh, Department for Agriculture, Department for Education, Department for uh, Economy. Department for Infrastructure and Department of Finance are, are the departments that we believe there is a possibility that they may exceed their cash. 45%. 45% limits. Um, so, uh, and going on to, to help explain that as well. Also, many departments are front loading payments to the earlier part of the year as part of the executive's efforts to support suppliers, the voluntary community sector, and other organisations which rely on government funding. So it's not strictly just those that have received new allocations, but it's also, to a certain extent, down to the timing uh, when they're actually have, making payments out from so the... Actually keeping the sort of the, the sectors going by pumping. Yes, yeah. Okay. Yeah. that makes sense. Uh, so, uh, as explained there, the Department of Finance is aware of at least five departments that may run out of cash before the 31st of July 2020, when a budget bill would normally have been expected to have received royal assent. Uh, we have explored some possible contingency arrangements that are available. The powers under Section 59 of the Northern Ireland Act and Section 7 of the Government Resource and Accounts Act can't be used in this situation because uh, a budget act has already been passed by the Assembly earlier this year. Uh, there is a power to make advances from the Consolidated Fund under Section 6 of the Financial Provisions Order, Northern Ireland 1998. It, it could be used in the very short term, however, it's limited to 2% of the total block provision for the previous year. Uh, and to increase that 2% cap would actually require primary legislation in Westminster because it's an accepted matter. So we're concerned that the 2% wouldn't be sufficient. Uh, in addition to this, our ability to prepare main estimates which reflect the executive's up-to-date expenditure plans have also been impacted. Estimates are written to the executive's most up-to-date spending plans, which for the main estimates would normally be the opening, position, opening budget position for that year. Uh, this would present a significant challenge as the executive's expenditure plans are continuing to evolve in the face of the COVID emergency, and an estimates document could actually be out of date before it would be completed. As a result, the Executive has agreed that instead the Assembly will be asked to pass a Budget Bill to approve a further vote on account. This will provide authority for departments to continue to operate through the current COVID-19 emergency period. The main estimates will be delayed until a later time, probably the autumn, when finances are in a more stable position. The amounts contained in this vote on account will not represent a set expenditure position but rather will be based on a percentage of the Department's 2019-20 provision, albeit calculated to reflect their likely cash and resource requirements in 2020-21. In effect, it will be extending the existing 45% vote on account to a greater level. So basically we're going to use what they've already spent, plus the pressures they've identified from COVID, 
but using that as the baseline for coming through for the estimates. That, that's correct. No, not 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 as a baseline coming through to the estimates, but for the for coming through to uh, this further vote on account. Right. Okay. Yeah. Uh, we're working to determine the actual level of the vote on account required for each department. For some departments, this may be greater than 100% of their 2019-20 provision. However, the level proposed will not, and stresses, it will not allow departments to incur expenditure greater than the budget the allocation for 2021, supplemented by any additional allocations for the COVID response. So. Just to do that, because one of the obvious questions we're, we're probably all busting to ask is okay, we've, managed, we've managed to spend 45% of it in sort of quarter one. You know, how are we going to get through to the end of it? But what we're saying is because it's been a lot of the expenditure has been front loaded, it's been the allocation of it, but there is no intent to go beyond what was in the budget and what's within the additional funding yeah, for the, COVID. The, those so, two things combined. So yes. those two things combined. Yes. So, but obviously, if we're going to have to find more money later on, that's when we're going to have to start looking at looking at getting into the reserve or sort of other issues as well. Yeah, yes, or or it's potent, potentially we could have more Barnet allocations coming right. later in the year as well. Although obviously we're not predicating anything on that. We're we're basing this on the opening budget position plus the additional allocations that have been agreed based on the Barnet uh, consequences we have already received. And of course, these five departments have already spent their 45% allocation, or have identified they will have spent it by the end of June. Yes. So we then got, we've act, they must have a fairly good handle then of what their estimates are likely to be for the rest of the year. Yes. Uh, well, bearing in mind now we're we're talking here about a vote on account, not just to see them through to the end of July, but now actually further into the to the autumn. Mm, yeah, the autumn autumn is quite an extendable beast. Uh, yes. Yeah, it could be, uh, you know, autumn technically takes you up to the 21st of December, depending which way you look <laughs> at it. Yeah, uh, yeah. I, I would, we would hope to be in a position to be bringing main estimates to back to the assembly immediately after the summer recess. Right. Is what we would be hoping to do. Uh, so if we do recess in the summer, we're looking at September. Yes. Sorry. Uh, so, uh, just to go on, it is normal practice for the budget bill to make use of accelerated passage, and the finance minister has asked the committee to agree to this understanding order 42.4. Uh, and once the bill has been drafted, officials will be available to answer more detailed questions from the committee to assist them in considering this. Uh, and just to add as well, given the pressing need for the bill to pass through the assembly and receive royal assent before any departments reach their cash limit. The Minister will also be asking the Assembly to suspend Standing Order 42.5 uh, in order to allow the Bill to complete its passage through the Assembly in less than 10 days. Uh, and just to close, the COVID-19 crisis has necessitated unprecedented, immediate and extraordinary public expenditure. The scale, timing and pace of the crisis is such that the, new, the usual estimates process, which provides the legal authority for the partners to spend, is insufficiently agile to provide an adequate response, and so this alternative solution is being pursued. Okay. Um, thank you very much indeed. Paul. Yes, Chair, thank you very much. So, uh, I, I would I would indulge your patience with me here, if you can, uh, committee and, and presenters. So, to try and heal a, a confused mind here. So we're in exceptional times. Things are quick moving. We get all of that. What you're basically asking us to do is that we really need to rerun the voting account. Uh, whenever we really should be geared up go into a main estimates round. Uh, and there's a reason why you can't do another budget, because we've already passed the budget. Am I, am I, am I still there on right ground? Uh, how then are we allowed to do a vote and account? Is my first question. I probably take question at a time. Okay. Yeah, yeah. It's over a my head. So, so how are we able to do a vote of a, another vote on account? Well, the, the, the assembly, uh, it's the assembly that uh, gives the authority for the issue of cash and the consumption of resources. And so any any budget bill which comes to the assembly in which the assembly passed will authorise the issue of cash from the consolidated fund and the use of resources by departments. So the, the, it is it is within the assembly's power, its competence to do that. Uh, 
ordinarily, at this point of the year, the executive would be bringing its final or its, its opening budget position for the full year. But as explained, because events are moving so fast, that it, it, the opening budget position, by the time we would actually get that estimates document to you, uh, because of the speed with which Barnet allocations have been coming and the executive have been having to make decisions on how to use those, it would be out of date by the time we could bring it to you. So that's so, the main reason why we're not getting main estimates? Uh, yes. So, so you did talk about us being prevented, the, sorry, the executive being prevented from bringing forward another budget uh, because we've already passed the budget. So, what was that piece? So um, the, what I had said was that the Stormont Agreement Implementation Plan um, had amended the Northern Ireland Act. So what had happened in that process was that the executive couldn't bring a budget um, uh, until they had been uh, informed by the Secretary of State of what the, the, the overall budget envelope was, right. and then a period of 14 days of waiting. Right, okay, so that was can. why the, the budget was at the 31st of March and not a lot earlier than we would have anticipated. Right, okay. So that was the mechanism we have we've already lived through uh, and been through. Just 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 one just just for clarity then for what we're actually doing is we're giving the approval for the assembly to draw down the consolidated fund, the money that's in the consolidated fund. Normally we would only do that if we'd have access to the main as estimates, but because we don't have access to the main estimates. What you're asking us to do as a committee is to approve the raw draw the consolidated fund because of the extenuating circumstances. Is that correct? That's, that's correct. So, so can I ask then on that consolidated fund, how much is that and where does it sit usually? It, well, what's the, the money which the consolidated fund has access to is predominantly funded by the block grant, mm -hmm. which is provided by Westminster, supported by uh, income which is raised locally through particularly the regional rate and, and, and other. Uh, so, so when you say we can draw into that, you're basically saying we can draw into all of the block grant and, and whilst we always vote an account for 45% roughly of the budget, what we're saying now is we need another vote and account and what you're really doing is giving us the authority to spend the block grant. Well, f further into the block grant. Uh, I should stress it will not be the 100% of the block grant. It will be further into it because the, uh, just as we do a, a vote on account followed by a main estimate here locally, uh, the UK public expenditure system follows the same process. So at present, the consolidated fund is drawing money from the, sorry, the Northern Ireland consolidated fund is drawing money from the UK consolidated fund based on a vote on account which was passed in Westminster. Yeah. Uh, Westminster will be bringing its next day. They, they don't refer to them as budget bills. They refer to them as supply and appropriation bills. Yes. But the equivalent legislation will be coming through Westminster. And when it is passed, that will then provide the, the full block grant for Northern Ireland. So uh, any additional vote on account which is passed by the Assembly now will be allow the Northern Ireland Consolidated Fund to then issue out any money that it has drawn from the UK Consolidated Fund, it will allow it to issue it out to departments. And just going back to the time when we didn't have the executive, is that up to 85% is what we're proposing? It, uh, of the... Of the Consolidated Fund? It, there, there isn't, there isn't a... a per, the, per, because the percentage limit would be set by the percentage that we, we put into this vote on account, which will, will the, which will come to the assembly. So, so what it, are you what are you proposing to put out? Uh, I, I can't give you an answer to that at the minute because we're still we're still doing that work to uh, assess exactly what amount each department will need. It's important for us to make sure that that percentage is as low as possible without having um, without you know allowing departments to run out of money. Um, so we need to make sure that that, that percentage is robust, um, and we need to kind of, uh, sort of interrogate that with departments to make sure that um, what they are saying to us is uh, a reasonable estimate of what they will spend up until uh, we have a, a main estimate in place. So will we know that percentage figure before we're being asked to vote on that next week? Y y yes. Uh, sorry, the vote next week will be f oh, not, will not be on this vote on account. So it, yeah. that's a separate issue. Yeah. The voting account is a separate issue with the percentage. The, the vote in the budget is the budget is for the entire year. Um, uh -huh. So that's yeah. the, there's a slight distinguish there. 
Yeah. Right. Okay, so, sorry, Paul. so can I ask you then, out of all the Barnet consequential money we've got, which I think is a total of 1.9 billion at the minute. 1.19, yeah. 1.19. For COVID, yes. For COVID, that's the, so. Where does this where does this be recorded? So that money's sucked in already and being spent and used. I take it. So we've still got a problem whereby five or six of the departments are saying their estimates are that or their forecasts are that they're going to run out of phone account money before June, July, and that's a an accountancy issue for them. And for us, obviously, they're a massive problem if we don't get authority to give them more money. But where does that 1.19 uh, or whatever it was, uh, where does that, how does that get sucked in the system and where is that set on a graph? Where, where, where is, and in the currency terms, where does that sit with the, photo, the new photo of account and the new budget and the new main estimates? Okay, maybe to take the budget element okay. of that yep. first. Be time to think far on that one. <laughs> um, uh, the, so £120 million of that is already contained within the 2021 budget. Um, so the budget that, we are, um, that the Assembly will debate and vote next, uh, next week will have £120 million of that. But obviously the significant chunk of that is outside. Um, the Minister was very keen to update the Assembly and Committee on those allocations and has done so um, by way of written ministerial statement. Um, and uh, should further significant funding be allocated, um, he may consider another update. But otherwise, further up the, the, that money, um, both the, one, the stuff that, that is announced and, and anything that the executive may also allocate between now and, and June monitoring, will then come in t through the in-year monitoring system, and it will be added into the system and into the budget at June monitoring. So. Um, that information will be provided to the uh, the committee um, as part of that June monitoring process. And that's the finance minister's. He has the power to decide where that money goes. Albeit some of it would have been obviously consequentials from treasury. No, the, the, it's the executive who have the power executive. to decide. It's not the finance minister. Okay. So, so could the executive not agree to allocate that money? to these, uh, I'm talking very basic terms here, to these five or six committee uh, departments who are forecasting that they're going to have problems before June. And that get you away from the issue of you having to then do something that's extraordinary here with regards what, to go to a double up. Well, well, the executive can agree on a budget allocation. What the executive don't have the power to do is to issue cash and use of resources from the consolidated fund that sits with the assembly not with the executive. Right. So what we're looking to do in this proposed budget bill, which will provide a vote on account, is to give that assembly's authority to those decisions that the executive have made. Hmm. So the executive have agreed an additional um, amount of money for the Department for Economy for business support. Mm -hmm. um, and because they've agreed that, then the money has to follow it, the cash and the resources have to follow it, but the executive don't have the authority to increase that, and that's where the, the assembly and the yeah, committee comes in. Uh, out of the four, out of out of the five or six budget, uh, sorry, out of the six, five or six departments that are forecasting this shortfall, I, I take it they'll be all at different levels of expenditure and need coming forward here. Uh, is there any, in your understanding, is there any that is more needed than, than others at this present time? Uh, you know, millions going to be short or a pound short. Where, where, where how, how, how bad or drastic is it? Without scaremongering, of course, but just to get a feel of how bad it is. Just uh, and uh, say this is just ver based on our very, very high level initial thinking, and it, say it, 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 uh, it's, it's not based on, on detailed analysis yet, but probably the department that we, we would be most concerned about would be the Department for the Economy, mm. just, just because of the, the amount of allocations they've received and the fact not only that they've received those allocations, but in order to help business and the, the go out as economy, comes in. they're trying to get the money out as, as fast as they can. And so rightly I think, so. And, and rightly so, yeah. yeah. So I think probably if all those departments, that's probably the one that we would be concerned could potentially hit the, the the buffers first. The last question, Chair, what happens for some reason 
the assembly doesn't give that authority, does not pass the, this, the, the second vote on account, what happens? Well, f frankly, the only, the only power that is open to a, a beyond another budget bill <coughs> to authorise any additional cash to be released from the consolidated fund is that small 2% contingency yeah. Which is contained within the 1998 order. Beyond that, to, to be honest, there, there, would, there would be no ability to, for money to be paid out of the consolidated fund. Okay. Uh, I if, thank you, Chair. Okay. Thanks very much today. Uh, Jim, your Minister. Yeah, um, thank you, Chair. I thought I had a grasp of this until this evidence session started, so bear with me. Um, the Minister is due to announce something tomorrow. 30th of April. What's that? Probably next week's debate. I'm not aware of anything tomorrow what specifically. Minister told us that. Got a written statement tomorrow. Statement tomorrow. What's Excuse me, doctor? Chair. Can I jump in there? Yes, please, John. Sorry. Right. I, I think what Mr. Allister is referring to is the budget document that will be published tomorrow. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So uh, that budget document. <coughs> tomorrow is going to be based, is it not on the 2021 figures, but we've heard today on the 1920 figures, or have I got that wrong? No, the budget that will be provided to MLS tomorrow will be based on the, it'll be the 2021 figures. Right. And will we be getting detail in that other than headline figures for each department? Yes, we will have information at spending area level within each of the departments. That, that information will be provided. So, just to judge how detailed that will be, is that a five-page document, a twenty-page document, a hundred-page document? What are we talking about? From from memory, oh, it's eighty pages. Right. So it has a fair bit of detail, has it, across each department as to their needs. So it will set out the spending area level detail for each department. It will also provide information on the, what the department does and has a, a chapter on COVID-19 response. So um, whilst we cannot include that in the budget, um, uh, departments have set out how they are responding to the COVID-19 challenge. Um, and I think that's, that's important information for MLAs and the wider public. So what is it that's going to be based on the 1920 figures rather than the 2021 figures? That will be the vote on account. Yes. The level of the vote on account that we would be proposing to set in the bill that will be hopefully coming to the Assembly. The budget be, number two bill. The budget number two bill yes. will be based on a percentage of what the 1920 provision was. And why not the 21 provision? It, because the that, that would then have us in the situation where we were tr trying to write it to an agreed executive budget position, which, as I was explaining, uh, is proving impossible because of the constantly changing public expenditure position. As so it would be out of date, so you're going to offer something that's more out of date, maybe a year older. Because, uh, it, well, it... It's not that it'll be out of date, but it, it'll be asking the Assembly to approve a, f a further vote on account until the up-to-date position can be brought in September. But it's going to base that vote on account on figures which are now over a year old. Well, they're, 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 well sorry, they're, they're not a year old. They're, they're the figures that were in the spring supplementary estimates right. which were passed okay. in March. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. I think... I mean, part of the, the reason for doing that is it, it's it's based on a, a position that has been previously approved by the Assembly. Um, whereas if you were looking at um, assessing that against the Executive's budget, the Assembly haven't yet uh, debated or voted that. So you've skirted around the, the question of what percentage will be in account. We know in the previous it's up to 45% of the spend. What's the figure this time? We we haven't finalised that figure yet. That is that is something we will be bringing back to the committee. Uh, we, uh, I'm when? hoping that that will be done over the next week or so. And but we're debating all this next Tuesday, aren't we? 
No, what, oh. the, the debate next Tuesday is on the opening 2020-21 yes. budget. The debate on this vote on account will be whenever the budget bill is brought, which I would anticipate will be l later in May. So that, and th there will be, as, as would normally be with a budget bill, there will be a you know, stage one, stage two debate and final debate on it at, at a later stage in May. Well, the budget bill set a limit on accruing resources. No, it, it won't. The uh, vote on account will normally only, and we're only proposing to seek the Assembly's authority to issue cash out of the consolidated fund and to consume the equivalent resources. Uh, we would, because it, it, uh, you actually require the detail contained in the estimates document to determine the level of accruing resources. We wouldn't be anticipating seeking the Assembly's approval to use accruing resources until that the main estimates are, are in a position to be brought. So the departments won't be able to use or spend their accruing resources to when? When the we anticipate a third budget bill, a budget number three bill in the autumn. And when? Set that. When? In, well, we would hope to be bringing that to the Assembly when the Assembly returns from its summer recess right. in September. But that would so, be with main estimates, sorry, Jim, that, that, that would be yes, with main estimates. That would be with the main estimates. And it's not until after that that then under Section 8 of Granny you could have the departments spend their accruing resources. That's correct. We, Is that not going to be a real problem for some departments? Uh, well, we, we will be factoring all that in whenever we are trying to set, assess the level of this vote on account to make sure that they have access to the cash that they need. So, so you're going to make up for that by boosting what they get on the account? Well, we, we'll, we'll be assessing the level of the, the vote on account to, to, to make sure that they have access to the cash that they need. To and see you can't them. bring in the authority to spend the accruing resources in the upcoming budget bill? No? We, we, we wouldn't, it certainly would not be something that wouldn't be normally done in a vote on account. These aren't normal we, times. I, I appreciate they're not, but I, we think it would be misleading to try to uh, guess what the level of accruing resources would be, because that's that's effectively what we'd be doing. Yeah, just sorry, just jump in just one final, But you mentioned earlier on you said about the June monitoring round. So how do you do a June monitoring round without a very good view of what your main estimates are going to be interdepartmentally? Inter so, so departments will have um, obviously they will have the, their budget for 2021 as. Um, has set out. Uh, they will also have an understanding of the additional allocations that they will have had around COVID and what the executive have allocated there. They will be able to um, assess uh, uh, what they need to reprioritise within their department. And the executive have given um, ministers authority to do that without having to come for approval at that at that position. But the important point that's led down the COVID bill, isn't it? It's uh, it's not it's not uh, it's not requiring specific legislation to to allow departments to do that. So it's just an executive agreement. But the important point around that is that um, whilst the ministers have the authority to move around within their own budget allocation, they still have to report that as normal to um, to the assembly through the June monitoring process. Right. Yeah. Jim, anyone? Yeah, that's okay. Thanks, Jim. Um, <clears throat> we're in unprecedented times. I, I don't think when you set the original draft budget, you could have envisaged where you'd be today. How many extra staff have been drafted into the Department of Finance to deal with what's been an onerous workload over this last few weeks? Certainly from, um, from PSD, none. We have been working very, very hard. My team has been working exceptionally hard and putting in very long hours to make sure that we are covering COVID, make sure that we are covering budget, and we make sure that we are covering um, the, the normal course of work. So we have been. Yes, but how many extra staff have you been allocated for that very difficult task? We have we have not needed extra staff. We have made sure that um, we can manage our workloads, working from home, doing all the appropriate social distancing. But we d we haven't. Ne uh, needed additional staff to do that. I think, as a result of Mr. Allister's questions, 
um, you may have answered this already, uh, sort of this idea in my mind that if there was an underspend in the COVID-19 funding, uh, could we keep that at, the, at, at, say, in six or seven months' time? Can we keep it to be spent on other pressing issues? What would happen had another spend arisen in that funding? So um, the, the COVID-19 funding that we get from Treasury is um, applied through the Barnett formula, um, and that uh, gives the executive flexibility to uh, allocate in line with local needs and priorities. So should there be an underspend in that um, funding, it would be available for the executive to reallocate. The, the caveat to that, and it's a very important caveat, is that Treasury are currently undergoing a reprioritisation exercise themselves um, within their departments. So they are looking at what funding they can cut back on um, and, and where they can kind of uh, change their their budgets, and should that affect um, the overall level of spend, then that Barnet will be applied to that. So we could effectively have a, a reduction in funding coming in later in the year, depending on that. So um, there's a delicate balance to be achieved with um, the, the 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 steps that we take to ensure that we are spending as much as we can on COVID, um, but also then making sure that should should there be some uh, reduced requirement there that we keep in mind that Treasury may come back uh, and reprioritise later in the year. Do you, do you have any information whether the Treasury are, sorry, Jim, uh, the Treasury are doing a mini COVID CSR then, are they? I, I don't have any information, but um, what I would uh, what I would say is they are looking at a, a reprioritisation exercise within the year. Um, in terms of the wider um, SR, um, they have obviously they're going to delay theirs, um, and I would imagine um, they will also look at how far in advance, how many years in advance that looks like. So, previously we would have expected three. It may be that they only do a, a single year, um, looking at the fiscal dynamics of what happens after COVID. Yeah. So year on year. Yeah. Uh, you, you've obviously concentrated uh, on expenditure to the committee, but. Are you keeping an eye on what's happening on income? Now, I'll just give you a few examples. I live in Ban Bridge. The last 12 buses that have passed me in my daily walk have all been empty. Not a single passenger in any of them. Why on earth are travelling? I don't know. Secondly, there is now no income on parking. Anywhere in Northern Ireland, all the park charging has stopped. So that's another income stream that has dried up. Um, is anybody checking to see what exactly is happening at that end? Because not only is business money in five of the departments flowing out faster than you expected, I suspect there's very little flowing in at the other end. Um, planning fees would be another thing, which I think is driven up as well. Is there, is there is a tab being kept on that? That's, that's actually one of the, the, the reasons why departments, some departments are actually having to consume cash. I mentioned, for example, the Department for Infrastructure as being one of the departments that could potentially uh, reach its cash limit before the 31st of July, and that is partly due to exactly, as you've just explained, the, the lost revenue from organisations like TransLink, which means that the department, whereas a department which, which always does subsidise TransLink, would normally spread that subsidy out over the course of the year. What it's effectively having to do is to front load a lot of that subsidy mm. in order to make up for the lost income. So that, that's, that is exactly one of the things that's led into this. And the final question is, when this is all over, hopefully quickly, I think the new story will be fraud. Because the department, quite rightly in my opinion, have tried to get as much money into the economy as possible to save businesses. But of course, typical Northern Ireland, there's one or two individuals have found a few loopholes to try and avail of perhaps uh, aid that they're not entitled to. Or there may be duplicate uh, payments. We had the Father Pat Buckley, of all people, very honestly returning a grant that he got, which he wasn't entitled to. I don't think other people are just as honest. Um, have you been able to set up procedures to try and analyse potential for fraud? Um, and I think it's been courteous to actually raise this issue at the moment, but when things settle down, I think that will be the story, that people have abused the situation. So you're telling me you have no extra staff, um, and that's interesting, but is anyone keeping an eye that all this money that's going out is actually going to the right source? Certainly for most of the um, business grant support, uh, that would be for the Department for Economy specifically to mm -hmm. be looking at. Um, but the 10,000 sure grants LSP or LPS? 
LPS is helping them in that process. Um, so it's not it's not particularly our area of DOF to um, to, to comment on, but um, I would imagine that the auditors, both in DFE and in DOF, are so looking at this uh, in conjunction with the, the the people that are supporting the policy. But surely, Department of Finance has an overall arching responsibility to make certain that things are, are not going astray. Uh, absolutely, um, we are the custodians of the public person. We're very proud of that. Um, um, but it's not my particular area. I'm not able to comment on it. Okay. Thanks very much, Steve. Pat? Thanks very much. <coughs> just want to stay on a point maybe that Jim said there. It's just, uh, I note that uh, DFI was given no allocation in the COVID funding. Uh, this is the department that has provided testing centres, as we know, and is using Translink uh, to, um, to, to bring our key workers, get them there back and forth. Uh, on the health service and uh, the vital needs for that health service to get there. We also know this challenge position that's facing TransLink and other critical aspects of DAFI, including Northern Ireland Water. Why is the department not given any fund? And I'm wondering, I look through all of the money which come through to the different departments, and I see that there is very, very little has went away of the Department of Infrastructure, given huge pressures on the fact Infrastructure not only is the key during the crisis, it is absolutely key uh, to the recovery. What is the department going to do to secure the future of these public services? And much as I welcome what is coming the way of TransLink, I don't think that it is enough in order to maintain that vital service. Can I just go on with the rest of my questions? I wasn't really going to bring that one up, Chair, sure, but just since it was brought in, I would like you to just deal with that there. Mm -hmm. And uh, the, the other, my other uh, question to you now uh, has to go back. You brought it up as well yourselves, the Department of Economy, and uh, my question is, um, much as it has to be welcomed, uh, there's a lot of information for help for businesses, and I welcome that. That's going out there to those businesses, but nothing for our students. Has the department considered how to help those that are struggling within that student? And as this COVID moves on, uh, I mean, the business that I was involved in myself, the public house business and the hospitality trade, uh, they're going to have to be kept in there much longer. And looking at what you said, what is the total expenditure for each department? And you also said that the budget containing the main estimates will be coming to us after uh, the summer. Is that correct? Uh, are you making consideration at the moment now for the possibility that you may well need a third budget and the allocation of those money to those which are going to be held in COVID-19 for much longer and much deeper than those that are able to get out of it a lot sooner? Uh, I mean, it's just questions. I know it's a lot of questions to fire at you, but I'm hoping that you are planning for that and you are aware of those questions. I have no doubt you are. Um, just, I'll try and take your questions in turn, but um, please do interrupt if I've missed something. Um, in terms of DFI, um, the, first of all, there's a, the executive have, have held in reserve £95 million for a transport sector response. Um, and I would imagine that the majority of that funding will go in some form to um, to DFI in terms of uh, their whether it's TransLink or whether it's support for um, airports or hauliers or whatever particular um, response that they they kind of for, formalise or, or finalise on that. So um, there is money held there for um, a transport sector response, and we're hopeful that um, that will help to address some of those really pressing concerns out there. Um, on the, the DFE, um, you're right that a lot of um, support has been directed towards business, and rightly so. Um, the, I think I understand that the DFE minister has raised the issue of student support um, with the executive, um, and obviously um, there will be a, a, the potential as well for the, for the Department for Economy to reallocate within its own funding to allow a, a support service there for students. So that, that issue is um, being considered by DFE. Um, on, on the budget side of things, um, there's, a, there's a slight nuance between the main estimate and budget. So, um, The budget that we agree now will be revised in June. It will be revised again twice more in the year as, as normal processes through the monitoring rounds. So we will, we will be constantly doing that, and that 
constantly comes the, the committee are aware of that process and, and are involved in that process as well so so the budget will will be looked at a number of times this year whereas the main estimate is just the legislative effect to allow departments to spend the cash and, and consume the resources so and uh, whilst it will the main estimate bit will come in in, in september it'll be once and then we'll revise it again in um in around January, February times for, for the end of the year. And we are all, always looking at the budget and we will be continually to, uh, revising the budget in light of the very fast moving COVID-19 situation. And the, the, so that's really, am I all right, Chair? Just to, yeah, one more. Yep. so that really pulls in that there may well be the possibility of three, of a third budget or more? Well, well certainly um, every time we reconsider the budget, um, so the budget is set before the financial year, and we reconsider effectively reconsider that budget um, three times throughout the financial year, every year. So that we, we have those three monitoring rounds every single year, and we anticipate that that happens this time. So there will be three opening up of the budget and, and looking at the, the, the margins in terms of what can be reallocated, what can be moved, and that sort of thing. So yes, we will have that constant um, assessment. Just, uh, the last point, sir. Am I all right? Yes. Mm. It's just that the £17 million, I think, come across just to rock the top of my head from the British government for airports and for ferries in order to try. And we know how vital uh, those links are to Northern Ireland. I remember myself when the Ulster Queen and the Ulster Prince were the last two ships sailing across the Irish Sea. So when that is cut off, it is vital for us to try and maintain that. Uh, there is no doubt that you notice the funding coming across from the British government centrally. Uh, is there? Uh, uh, I, I presume it's, it may well not be enough in order to, to sustain that. But are you allocating or thinking about how you may add to that in order to enhance it and to maintain those vital links to Northern Ireland? So um, there's a couple of issues. Um, the first one is that um, for some services, um, um, potentially ferry services, I'm not 100% sure, um, on some of the airport uh, routes. Uh, the, the funding will be uh, potentially provided directly from the UK government, so it will not necessarily come through the executive to do that. Uh, where that does not happen, sorry, Joanne, yes. Sorry, sorry Chair, can I, can I just jump in there? Um, it has not been our side of DOF that has been involved in the negotiations, but DFI and DOF have been engaging with departments of transport on those packages, and the executive is contributing to the overall package for both ports and airports. Joanne, is that the 60-40 uh, funding split with the Department of Transport? Yes, that's correct. Okay. So it's, is the 17 million our part of it, or is that part of, is that the whole package? I confess I can't remember the actual number. I think 17 million may be the whole package, of which we're contributing part of that, but I'd need to confirm. Yeah. Certainly we would be providing um, our funding out of that transport sector element, that £95 million that we are holding to consider those issues. Right, thanks. Matthew. Thank you, Chair, um, and thank you, um, I speak into the mic correctly, thank you both for coming and for um, having to crane your necks to take questions from me. Um, certainly this, um, I suppose it's worth saying um, that I think what a lot of people have reflected is that the, budgetary posi the budgeting position for Northern Ireland was already complicated by the fact that we hadn't had devolved institutions for three years. We had to play catch up in terms of allocating money and a slightly anomalous um, correcting where we were and finalising the budgetary position for 1920. That was then been compounded by COVID-19. So I suppose it, um, an appeal on behalf of the committee and, a, and, a, and a, perhaps a comment for all MLAs is that we all need to do our best to try and simplify this process for people because it's bewildering for us, and you know, um, it's become very, very complicated. The questions I want to ask are really about detailed allocations for COVID-19, and how we are <coughs> going to be, um, how they're going to be communicated to us in the document tomorrow. The document tomorrow is about budget for 2021. It won't yet fully incorporate the 1.2 billion. Is that right? That's correct. COVID it will allocations. Only, it will only have the 120 million pounds for COVID. Um, in it. But it will have a table or an annex, which is what sort of indicative about how that billion and 1.2 billion is going to be spent. Yes. Yeah, so whilst it won't be included within the department's allocations within the budget, um, there will be a table that sets out the the COVID uh, 2019 executive allocations. How much detail will that be? Will that be by department? Will it be by hypothecated? Air? So, for example, will it include 
um, specific amounts for, for example, the small business, the 10K small business grant scheme, or will it be more vague than that? Um, it will set it out by department and um, the title of the particular response. So, for instance, for the, the small business grant, it will literally say small business grant. Okay. Um, and the 1.19 billion of extra Barnet consequentials, that is the correct number as of when? Because I'm, there, there was another, there's like an extra 5 million that came in a few days ago. Is that right? Or there, there, there it seems to be. Um, yeah, that 1.19 uh, billion is correct as of this morning. Right. Okay. Um, and when it comes to um, uh, COVID-19 and flexibility for departments in terms of how they um, uh, how they manage pressures and how they manage allocations within their settlement, um, can you talk about what flexibility is being given to departments and how? Um, and how it's being used? Um, so the executive have agreed for departments to have full flexibility within their existing budget um, for 2021 and to allow them to respond um, as much as they can within the control totals that they have. So um, they're, they're allowed to move money wherever they want within the resource, but they can't move between resource and capital, for instance. So they have to still have to maintain their control totals. But within those control totals, executive ministers have full flexibility. Does that mean that money that was announced by the finance minister in March, specific allocations that were made then can be, in effect, moved by departments? If it's Ardell money that was already in, it, can, it could be theoretically already be moved? So the specific allocations um, are slightly different. They would uh, remain specific allocations unless the executive agreed otherwise, but the vast majority of departmental funding um, is available for reprioritisation. Okay, so it can't be switched from Dell to capital or capital to Dell, but it can be reallocated under those headings? Yeah, so it can't be switched from resource to capital or capital to resource, but it can be reallocated within their own control tools, yes. Okay. So just, I, I suppose, for the purpose of getting it on the record, what we will be... So we'll be debating effectively next week a budget which doesn't include the $1.2 billion, but we will have effectively an additional explanatory note with a little bit of detail about the $1.2 billion. Yes, um, we have within the, the budget document itself um, a, a chapter uh, with departments um, setting out how they are responding to the COVID-19 position, as well as um, a, a table that will include that. So what guidance did the department give to departments in terms of detail as to how they accounted for or explained their additional COVID spending? So um, the departments were asked uh, to set their their detail out, um, basically along the lines of the, the, the broad three areas where the executive are um, wanting to provide support. So that's the continuation of key services, including the NHS, support for business, um, and the protection of the vulnerable. So that those are the sort of the three areas that departments will speak to within that. Document. So I'm, for for example, I'm in the education department, and my I don't have to say I have I don't have to say that um, it, as, under our increased allocation, I have spent X on um, uh, you know whatever it is, kind of um, <laughs> subsidise extra subsidise you know subsidise supply teachers pay. Although we haven't had that announcement yet, hopefully we will have it. And they don't have to say that; they just have to say it comes under one of the three broad headings. Yes, um, they don't necessarily have to mention specific areas, um, but um, they can just say an amount. They can just. Could you, sorry, could you remind me of what the three areas again are? Jeff? So there's um, a continuation of key services. Continuation of key services. There's the support for business, and yeah. there's the protection of the vulnerable. So that 1.2 billion tomorrow. First with the document, and then with the, the minister next week. If, if essentially, what we'll be getting is a large amounts of money next to protecting public services as a as a general heading. Yes. So um, I, I'm not sure that departments in their chapter will give you the exact amount. It'll be in the table, mm -hmm. um, but it will. Departments will provide a narrative as to how they are supporting that because it's not just about the money that they've got. It's about the services that they continue to provide or the things that they are reallocating in order to support and provide additional services to those specific areas in this time. So um, it wouldn't be right to say education have only got five million for 
service X because actually maybe they are reprioritizing um, other areas and they're, they're providing a lot more funding into that particular area and support. In terms of um, part of the function of the Department of Finance is obviously um, uh, as a spending control function, um, keeping an eye effectively on spending within other departments. How has that role changed as a result, you know, through the COVID process? Has it been, um, are you doing less of it? And that's not a, you know, an implied criticism there. Are you doing less of it or are you doing it in a different way? Um, it's slightly not my area, but um, I am aware that departments and supply are in daily contact at the minute. Um, so I would imagine that, that that analysis and that assessment is only enhanced at this moment in time about what they're trying to do and how they're trying to change things. Barry, maybe yeah. as big as uh, say, Essentially, for every department, there is a, a supply team. Mm -hmm. with, uh, well, the supply team may have a responsibility for one or two departments, but yet yeah, we're in regular contact on a daily basis with our counterparts in the finance branches in those departments. And uh, the pressures, for example, which departments have ad had ad identified as a result of the COVID-19 response, <coughs> they, they are f and do fluctuate on a fairly regular basis. So, uh, and, and any of the information that's been brought to the executive, that's why uh, certainly there's been a number of papers to the executive to revise the pressures as departments uh, gain more information about about what the pressures are. Sure, can I maybe face. jump in a bit there? Yeah, yes, go ahead, John. Uh, yeah, it, it, it's just to say sort of two two points. Firstly, we talked about departments being able to reprioritise their, their budgets. But can we just be clear that where they are given additional COVID-19 funding for a specific purpose, for example, grants to small businesses, it must be used for that purpose and that can't be moved to general departmental pressures. And in terms of the expenditure approval rule, we, we still require expenditure approval to take place. We have put in a slightly expedited process for the COVID-19 response, which is template-based, but there's no slackening of that level of control or appraisal on what departments are doing. Okay, that's helpful. Thank you, Joanne. And I suppose my final question is, um, uh, and it like a follow-on from the last question, what, um, how has your relationship with the UK Treasury changed in terms of reporting pressures to them, and have you found that relationship productive? Clearly, there was a, um, no pun intended, a bit of a roadblock or in terms of releasing funding or finally agreeing the package for protecting the infrastructure and um, freight, um, or there appeared to be. Um, has that relationship? Is that working smoothly? Is it, uh, and how has it changed? Um, we, we have daily calls with our Treasury counterparts and devolved administration colleagues um, right throughout the, the COVID-19 process. Um, and whilst you know, that specific area, um, th there may have been tension elsewhere in the Treasury, certainly our relationship with our Treasury counterparts is good. Um, we are, they are keen to make sure that we are involved as much as we can be. Um, and it's, um, it's obviously important for them to be able to um, provide the, the information to us as, as and when they get it so that we have a, a very good flow of information. Can I just say, that's the devolved spending teams, I presume, inside the Treasury that you're... Correct, yes. And but they will be different if there is a, like a policy specific, bit of, like for example, on Ports, airports, this, you know, the, the, that will be the transport spending bit of the Treasury. Are, are they um, being as accommodating and helpful as the devolved spending team? It's, it's hard to, to know exactly because obviously our conduit is, is through the spending team and uh, everything is directed through our own particular spending team. But certainly where we have had particular issues, um, our spending team have been very good at trying to set up um, meetings where uh, we would have direct um, contact with either the spending team of the appropriate area within within England or actually um, people from that particular department itself. So um, the, that particular relationship is, is quite good. Um, we've recently had one on, on health, so we've had the, the, the Treasury spending team, the health spending team talking to us. Yes. One final question, Chair, for me. Could you, you final, elaborate final. on it? Uh, on where, where there had been issues? Do you, do you want to tell us which issues those were? 
I, I can't think of anything offhand. <laughs> <laughs> yes, we have a question there, Matthew. Sean. Yeah, thank you, Chair, and thank you, men. In terms of the small business grants, and it's been very good, and money has went out the door very quickly, but there have been anomalies where people have set up business in the last year or don't have a business property. Is the department or the department uh, looking at or department economy contingency plans for to uh, bring funding out for those people? Certainly, we have um, forty million pounds um, set aside um, for business response and business support, um, and the Department for Economy Minister is looking at areas where businesses have effectively fallen through the gaps, yeah. um, and that forty million pounds will be. Uh, will be used to try and support businesses where they haven't had uh, an initial level of support immediately. So hopefully we'll be able to to, to do that and uh, understand works progressing on that. Yeah, yeah that's, that's fine, Joe. Yeah, thanks, Sean. Thanks very much, Steve. No, though, we've got a further on on our agenda. We've got an issue that's come through from uh, the leisure industry. We're asking questions about additional support as well, so that might be something that would be useful to do that with. Yeah. Uh, before we just move on, just one final thing. Uh, there's a lot of things we've been talking to you about here about the preparations, obviously, for a third budget bill, the requirements for what we're going to have on account, the amounts we're going to be able to spend on those reasons as well. One of the issues we need to be thinking about is a recovery plan for Northern Ireland when we get to the other side. Could you outline to me and to the department or the committee what the department is doing about looking at a recovery plan to take us to the other side? We have seen some additional. We've seen some initial information that's come from the Scottish government. We've seen some information that's come from the Welsh government. We understand there's some discussions going on in Dublin at the moment, but there doesn't seem there seems to be a bit of a paucity of information about what's happening within Northern Ireland PLC. Can you outline what the department is doing about planning for the recovery, which is probably just going to be as important as actually dealing with the crisis itself? Uh, certainly. So. Um I sit on a group that um, has been formulated within the Department for Economy, um, looking at longer, medium-term support for businesses, um, that kind of vulnerable but viable group. Um, so uh, that, that's in its early stages of planning. Um, obviously, this has um, hit us relatively unexpectedly, so um, they are still gathering information and, and, and that kind of analysis stage. Um, and looking at what potentially could how, how we could respond and in what way. So um, certainly you'll be aware that we have written to the chair of the economy committee because one of the issues we want to look at between both finance and economy is how we support for both departments being able to move forward. Excellent. And have you been also engaging with members of the business community? Um, that not directly myself um, or our team, but I, I I would imagine that through the Invest NI and. Uh, the Department for Economy contacts that they will be doing that. Thank you. Chair, if, if I can just jump in there. Yes, please. I, I think it's just important to realise that the recovery plan is a matter that affects the whole and not just the Department of Finance. So we can only comment on those bits which we're involved in. Each department will have its own remit on that, and it's something that we couldn't really give you a broad overview of at this stage. Yeah, but we need the money from somewhere, and it'll have to come from the Department of Finance. <laughs> It will also, to a certain extent, depend on the UK-wide recovery plan and where, whether we get Barnet on that or whether there's UK-wide schemes. So we're still very early stages, but it's important that the executive actually formulates that recovery plan, obviously in conjunction with the Department of Finance on the funding of that. Uh, another question from the, uh, the Deputy Paul Frew. Uh, yeah, thank you, Chair. Uh, can I just something that Jim Wells had raised earlier about accountancy and fraud? We know that there's now going to be a couple of other schemes going out, one to do with a mop-up scheme, if you like. But there was also one that was about registering if you were a business that didn't pay rates directly. So I'd paint a scenario for you whereby there was a business premises at his home, a shed, and it was a mechanic paint shop, let's say, for example. And he has sort of taken a step back and he's rented that space out to someone else. Now that someone else hasn't received a 10k grant, yeah. but the original business has, even though they aren't really operating anymore. So I suspect this new registry will be for the new guy, but should the older guy have received the 10k if he's not operating? And how will the Department of Finance be able to claw that money back? 
Um, it, it, it's not particularly f um, under our remit. Um, it, it's probably a matter to for uh, LPS to discuss with the Department for Economy um, in understanding the, um, w what properties were involved in that initial assessment for rates and how then that works in practice and whether there's any arrangements for clawback. But I wouldn't, I wouldn't understand it myself. It was probably for LPS to answer. Because a lot of this was just sprinkled down, and we understand why. Some of it was automatically sprinkled down. You didn't have to apply for this. So there will be a lot of this, I suspect, where through the scattergun approach, which we badly need it, uh, we need it basically to throw money down at businesses at that time. There will be a lot of scenarios where by people who have ceased trading will now have got 10k in their bank account just all of a sudden. Uh, that could happen quite a bit. Just on another point, uh, more for the committee, I suppose, sure one. Chair, is see out of all the responses we've got from the committee around the budget, is it is it my is it am I right in saying that the committee for the economy, the the sheet, the overall sheet, the universal sheet, has come back not filled in, and that's the only uh, chair. Originally, they sent that an error. And it was included, then included in packs in error. When I noticed it, I, before it was included in packs, I got onto the Department of the Economy, but in the meantime, it got into packs. So you see in table papers, the complete one for the Department for the Economy is included in table papers. Right, OK. So, so at least they have responded. Yes. Yep, OK. okay. Lisa? Thank you, Lucas. Um, uh, thank you as well, too, for uh, your presentation today. Uh, Coronavirus, I know, will say at the present time, it seems to have, in every respect, eclipsed Brexit. But in fact, it is on the horizon as well. Uh, and what <coughs> preparations uh, are actually being done in relation to that at present? So, uh, Brexit is is very much on our radar, albeit maybe potentially on the periphery of our radar at the minute. Um, but certainly, um, before the COVID-19 situation had um, materialised, we had initiated an initial exercise with departments to um, look and assess their potential departmental pressures in relation to the end of the transition period um, and what that might look like for them. It's a very initial view, um, as departments will not be able to appropriately assess that their requirements will tell more is known about how and in what form we transition out of out of that period at the end of the year. However, we felt it very important that we take that initial view. So um, that work has been slightly delayed because of COVID-19. We're still awaiting a number of departments' responses on that, um, including the Department of Health. But it's a sort of time that you, it, it's not the time to hassle the Department of Health because um, they're they're obviously engaged elsewhere. Um, but we're hoping to um, get something, a response from them maybe uh, next week. Um, so. We are finalising that exercise at the minute, with three fairly major departments, I think, not having a response um, in with us yet. Where, uh, that those costs look like about £36 million, um, and that is in relation to how the, the Northern Ireland Protocol is implemented here. Um, but again, that is it is just an initial view, so it allows us to take that initial view to Treasury and say, we are coming to the end of the, the, the transition period. We will have costs, um, and we're looking to see what um, response Treasury will have. They have indicated they might consider a case for additional funding required to implement the, the Northern Ireland Protocol. So we'll be looking to discuss that with them. Um, but certainly, the, the the process hasn't been forgotten about. We're still doing things, but it's taken a slightly longer time than we expected. Okay, thanks, sir. Matthew, sorry, sorry, sorry. Melissa. Uh, and given that, just being the case, that uh, is there also then an argument that uh, an extension would be appropriate uh, in dealing with many of these matters at the present time in relation to Brexit? Not for me to answer that one. <laughs> <laughs> nice try, Melissa. Well, you're getting it. Matthew, do you want to come in with a very short one? Yeah, that's very quick. I'd love to um, get that. I'm sure Melissa and I probably quite like the same answer. Um, I won't try it again, though. Um, just want to use the, the, you, what you're saying is you're doing a scoping exercise. The scoping exercise you're doing is on the implementation of the Northern Ireland Protocol and the costs associated, and, and but also practical implementation plans. What, is that what you're saying, or is it? Yeah, so um, we're, we're trying to gauge what departments' uh, costs might be in relation to. Um, exiting the EU transition period. 
So more broadly, not just the... It's, it's a broad issue, but also um, we're looking at specifically those Northern Ireland protocols as well. So, so it's, a, it's all encompassing. It's very initial. Departments aren't quite sure yet, um, simply because we're not quite sure what that transition looks like. Um, Tell me about it. Yeah, so, so it, it, it's basically, we're, we're taking a number of bites of the cherry at this one. So we'll, we'll ask departments now, we'll start to engage with Treasury with a, an initial view. And then once the plans start to become, um, once the plans start to crystallise, we'll be able to go back to departments and re-look at that um, and see what, what their position is at that stage. Have you given, have, has information gone into the um, preparation of the specialised committee, which is meeting tomorrow? No, we, we, uh, this, is a, this is an incomplete picture that we have at the minute, um, and we haven't done very much analysis on it, simply because our time has been taken on COVID. And so, you, but is it the fi very final point, Chair, is it, did you say it was four departments, haven't come, Northern Ireland departments haven't come back with any information yet at all in their preparations? My understanding is that we're waiting three, depart three. department returns. Which is more than a third of Northern Ireland departments. Mm. Well, no doubt Andrew McCormick will be... Uh the good point by, of course, not having any main estimates yet. They'll have a good chance to have a good look at it by the time they come back to us in September. Pat, very sure, short thanks. one. And it's just a yes or no. It might even be fair to ask it. But I was wondering if the Department of the Economy signs off on the grants for those who applied after the opening of the 10K grant. I'm not aware. No. So Sorry. There's no, there's no, you haven't seen any finance for that going through yet? Or? Um, I, not not personally. It was just yeah. Okay. Thank you very much indeed. Um, I think we've had a, quite a substantial discussion uh, about this, and for that, I thank you very much indeed. But uh, I'm obviously you're staying here for a bit further, sort of concessions. But we will try to control the timing as we go through it. Uh, the next item on the agenda for me is the departmental budget. Sorry, sir. Sorry. The. Yes. This item. Sorry, sir. Thought I wasn't reading your script there, Mark. There. Uh, looking at the departmental uh, budget, I invite discussion on the suggested committee position of the departmental budget, the clerk's briefing paper at page 18. I'd like to seek agreement to a committee position on the departmental budget. Comments? I don't think there's much choice. No. Agreed. Uh, if we move to the executive budget, I refer members to the suggested committee position on the executive budget of the clerk's briefing paper at page 18. Uh, the committee may wish to form an interim position on the executive budget to be updated with the views of other statutory committees and finalise once further consultation has taken place in advance of future budget bills. I think after what I've heard today, I'd be quite minded to do that. Um, and the evidence provided by the department today's evidence in session the view of forming a committee position on the executive budget. I would like to get your agreement to publish the raised papers on the committee's web page for information. Are we content? Great. Okay. I'd also like to advise members that the raised paper contains a number of additional important scrutiny points, and I think that would be useful if we pass those on to the department for answers. Would we be agreed with that? Agreed. Agreed. Content. And I'd like to seek agreement to forward the raised papers to the department for a response to the scrutiny points formally to do that. If we agree to that? Excellent. Thank you very much indeed. And I would like to invite back in. Um, Joanne, are you still with us? Yes, I'm still here, Chair. Okay. Uh, can we back in Barry and Emer, please? Thanks very much today. Barry, it's been ages since I've seen you. <laughs> it's like Come on, guys. <laughs> you must be thinking, what did I do wrong today? I've <laughs> got a time for a glass of water there. Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I would like to draw members' attention to the following papers related to this agenda. Item the clerk's brief on page 221. The departmental briefing paper, use of sole authority of the budget on page 222. And Eber, please, uh, please, give us, uh, please make your opening statement. Thank you, Chair. Um, as you're aware, the use of the sole authority of the Budget Act, as indicated by a black box in the notes to the department's estimate, occurs when no specific legislation has been passed by the Assembly to authorise the delivery of a particular service or function. Therefore, the department which is providing this service or function is relying on the Budget Act to not only authorise the expenditure on the service, but also to authorise the service or function itself. Ordinarily, the sole authority of the Budget Act should only be used for relatively small levels of expenditure, usually below 1.5 million pounds, mm -hmm. or for a relatively short period of time, not more than two years. The detailed guidance around the, sole, the use of the sole authority of the Budget Act is set out in Managing Public Money Northern Ireland. However, 
As the Assembly was not sitting for the three years up to January 2020, and there, there is therefore a backlog of legislation which should have been brought through the Assembly during that time to authorise a range of services. As a result, there are services highlighted with black boxes in the 1920 Spring Supplementary Estimates, which are for larger than normal amounts and which have, would have been delivered under the sole authority of Budget Acts for longer than would normally be the case. The previous five Budget Acts, which have been taken through the Westminster Parliament by the Secretary of State, have each contained black box services, and Parliament passed these Acts in the knowledge that it was providing authority for these services on the sole authority of those Budget Acts. As the Minister explained in the final stage debate on Monday the 9th of March, the guidance in managing public money in Northern Ireland does not limit the Assembly's ability to legislate for anything that is within its competence to ensure that services are delivered to citizens. The Finance Minister also assured the Assembly that his executive colleagues are in the process of bringing legislation for these services to the Assembly. As these separate pieces of legislation, whether new primary legislation or secondary legislation, come into force, the number and scale of services being delivered on the sole authority of the Budget Act will be reduced, so that in future it will only exist for very small levels of expenditure or for the delivery of services for a very short period of time, which do not warrant the passing of separate primary legislation. The paper that has been provided to the Committee goes into further detail about those cases in the 2019-20 Spring Supplementary Estimates and Corresponding Budget Bill, which are more substantial than would normally be the case. It includes an explanation as to why sole authority of the Budget Bill has Just been Just for the record, could, uh, could we state how much more than it was than the $1.5 million? Yeah, I think $1.1 billion. Yes. So there's a slight factual difference, isn't there? There is. The paper includes an explanation as to why sole authority of the Budget Bill has been required and what steps are being taken to ensure that it will not be required in future. Um, if the committee has any questions about the use of the sole authority of the Budget Act in general or about any of these individual cases, we will endeavour to provide you with that information um, that you require. Um, I should point out very specific details of particular functions within individual departments may be better addressed to that department, but we will do our best to take you through it today. Um, obviously, the concern we have is the difference between 1.5 million and 1.5 billion. The fact, and I refuse point blank to talk about dead cats and Schrodinger's cats and everything that's in black boxes, they're not in black boxes. But the key thing to this is the fact that there also seemed to be double accounting because some of these figures were appearing in two departmental areas rather than just one. And to say that it wasn't our fault, God, but it was Westminster's and they did it before doesn't necessarily, to me, show that the department are on top of this. And I have real issues about how this, is, how this has been managed and how it's, how it's been looked at as well. So, first of all, can you explain to me why it was appearing in multiple departments? Uh, the, two, uh, the two main issues uh, which were black boxed, which appear in more than one department, were those relating to historical institutional abuse and victim, victims and survivor schemes. Uh, as you know, these uh, have been recorded as potentially being provisions, which both the could sit with the department for uh, justice and the executive office. Uh, those provisions were created because there is the possibility that either or both of those departments may have to take a contingent, sorry, to create a provision <coughs> or a potential future liability as a result of the, the uh, legislation which was passed at Westminster. At the point in time that the estimates were being prepared and being, or the spring supplementary estimates were being prepared and the budget bill was being brought to the assembly. It wasn't 100% clear to those two departments exactly how much of that potential liability would rest with each individual department. That is a process which will be finalized when both of those departments uh, present their accounts and lay their accounts. Those accounts would have been due to have been led before the summer recess, but because of the COVID situation, that has had to be delayed. I, I understand it's due to be in September now that those accounts will be laid, and those will finalise exactly how much of that potential future liability will rest with each department. That 
uh, uh, that will also be assisted by the fact that in um, further enacting legislation it has already been, in the case of the historical institutional abuse, has already been brought, and in terms of the Victims and Survivors Scheme, it is due to be brought forward in the near future. Uh, so it is possible that uh, actually, but by the time those accounts are laid, that actually the, the further legislation will be in place, in which case less or indeed none of that may actually be resting on sole authority of the Budget Act. But we had to bring to you the position it was whenever the Budget Bill was being brought to the Assembly. And at that stage, because enacting legislation hadn't been brought forward, there was therefore at that point in time no other statutory authority, but a li potential liability existed for those departments. And to have not to have not presented that to you would have been misleading the Assembly by, by not making the Assembly aware that there was a potential future liability. Mm. You didn't make us aware it was double counted? Oh, sorry, sorry. Through the chair, through the player, please, Chip. Yeah. A, you'll, you'll get your chance. Yeah. You'll get your chance. But the fact that is that 10 per cent of the Northern Ireland budget, roughly speaking, no, 12.5 per cent with my maths was in your black box of 1.5 billion. That, that's correct. And that is in any way acceptable? But, well, as I say, if, if a, a potential future liability has been created for a department, uh, whether it be done through a piece of Westminster legislation, if it was done as a result of legislation assembly, if it was done for uh, as a result of any other occurrence, uh, that, that liability, we, we can't ignore the fact that that liability has been created and it would be it, for the department not to record that in its accounts would be fraudulent. Yeah, but you counting. see the thing is, you said for a department. Yes. But how can two departments put it in their accounts? It, two departments shouldn't be putting in their accounts, but the point was at the point at which that budget bill was being presented to the Assembly, it wasn't clear which of those two departments and it would be, or it could be a combination of both. So the potential liability was there at that point in time for both departments. Uh, Paul, oh, you don't want to speak. Jim, go ahead. Yeah, but you said there was no statutory authority, but the legislation had already been passed in Westminster. But, but how there was legislative authority. But there, there was a following, following on from the primary legislation. There was, uh, my understanding is, there was further enacting le secondary legislation, which had to be made to actually give that, uh, enact that primary legislation. Well, be that as it may, on the double counting, do you not think the minister should have expressly drawn that to the attention of this committee, and to the house in his speech on the budget? Well, he, he, he did. Only when challenged. In the, in the final. Only when challenged. Uh, not to be pedantic, but the black box itself is the mechanism by which we highlight yes. these issues. But uh, only I or others noticed it. It had never been mentioned. Like here you have a situation where 500 million approximately is pleaded on behalf of two departments. It's the same 500 million, and no minister... Uh, bothers to tell the committee or bothers to tell the House until they're challenged. Do you think that's good? Well, the, the, me the mechanism for drawing the use of sole authority to, of the Budget Act is by putting the black box in the yeah, but Which, which uh, point did the red flag go up and say the, red, the black box is only normally 1.5 million? <laughs> it's now become 1.5 billion. Where, why were the alarm bells not going off? Well, the provision is there. While it's normally 1.5 billion, it's not an absolute figure, and you know the authority is there. I do accept your point, Chair. And going forward, I mean, you know, we, we, we're, we're sorry. I'm, I'm not. I'm, I'm, I'm sort of really. I've, I've thought before this. I thought we had a reasonable understanding, but the fact that we're looking at double accounting, we're looking at not 1.5 million, but 1.5 billion. We're looking at. You know, we of committees have been told to keep a careful look, bearing in mind what was going on RHI and keeping an idea on what was going on with public monies and these issues as well. And what 
I've been told here today is basically because Westminster did it, and therefore we decided to do it. But it just seems to be perfectly all right. Or am I, or am I getting this completely no, wrong? Well, I've, Westminster I've, brought in primary legislation that put a statutory or put a duty here in Northern Ireland to deliver the services, which had to be enacted through secondary legislation. So the liability rose for Northern Ireland departments here. There was no clear definition at the time as to which department would be responsible, but there was every likelihood that, well, we knew that the enacting legislation was coming in. So there had to be some cover in the estimates and the budget bill to allow the spend to happen. But the decision wasn't taken as to which department. Now that will be clarified as this year progresses and the departments are, are given their general tasks under, the, under each scheme. Could I also stress as well that this, this is the creation of a provision for a potential future liability. It is not cash being paid out. It, it, it's not immediate expenditure. No, no, but this is accounting. It's, if, yes, if, 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 yes. Put it this way. I've been a chief executive of, a, yes. of several organisations. If, if my CFO came to me and told me I'd made double accounting provisions to the tune of a magnitude of 10 out than where it should be, I think I would be getting a wee bit concerned. But the, the, the point is, we, we're, we're bringing the budget bill significantly in advance of when that accounting happens, because that accounting happens when the accounts are laid, by which stage it will be known if there is a provision, and if so, which department, department. the provisions will be set against. Uh, but w what we're doing with the budget bill is coming to the Assembly in February or March, before accounts are laid in June. To say, to seek approval for each of each individual department that it could have this potential liability, and therefore, it could have to create a provision. But our accounts aren't going to be laid in June, are they? Well, well they would be laid. But they, would, they would normally be laid before the summer recess, because of this, because of this particular circumstances this year it will be in. in so, so when you were negotiating sorry, with sorry, Treasury, sorry, Jim, sorry, uh, yeah. when you negotiating with Treasury, did they know you were double counting it? Uh, we. We know that the, the, what the potential amount of the provision is as a whole, so therefore when we do a return to Treasury on behalf of Northern Ireland Bloc as a whole, we've, we're reporting the total amount of the potential provision. What differed in the estimates that were brought to the Assembly is because, at, because there's a separate estimate for each department and the Assembly votes cover for each individual department. If we had only scored or only shown a potential provision against one department, that means if any or all of that provision had ended up uh, when the accounts are laid, scoring against another department, that department and that accounting officer would have had an excess vote. So in terms of what we have reported back to Treasury, no, we have not double counted shown to right, There's one other thing I want to ask you about. You go ahead, yeah. Northern Ireland screen. It's an arm's length body. How was it ever set up? Because arm's length bodies can only be set up surely by legislation. And yet it turns out on your brief to us today, you're now going to have to retrospectively correct that. How was it ever set up? It was set up uh, under what was then the Department of Culture, Arts and Leisure. But how? I, I, to be honest, I, I would need to go back and, and look at the exact. Well, well would you not expect your supply officer with decal to have spotted that here we have a company, that here we have a, an organisation, Northern Ireland Screen, getting money, public money, and has never been properly established? Yeah, but it, it, the point was, it, it was set up under decal. The problem not arose properly. when that responsibility then transferred for the, to the new. Department for the economy. There's never been legislation or any statute revision establishing Northern Ireland Screen. Is that not correct? We will provide more detail to, to look at that. Uh, to, more closely. Because, uh, as as Emer explained, there, uh, uh, in terms of the exact detail over some of those individual services, we would need to go back to the to the department to give you greater detail. Yeah. Well, well uh, one of the points I want you to take away from this is that. I would have expected your supply officer with decal to have picked up on that. I think he was the same supply officer that didn't pick up on some things in the RHI. For the Department of Culture, Arts and Leisure? I think the same gentleman 
maybe at a different time. But the point I'm making is, why did the supply officer not pick up that we're funding out money to an organisation which hasn't been properly established? We'll have to look into the history of it. Yeah. Well, I think we'd like to hear back on that. Uh, Jack Thank Peter. You. Yeah, I suppose this brings, this the crux of all this is transparency, really. Uh, and accountancy and making sure that what we get presented to us, either as a committee or as an assembly, is accurate. And whilst we're not all brains of Britain, uh, there should be a level of transparency in a minister's statement to the House, highlighting things like the multiplication of the use of the black box, why, uh, you know, and, and giving a defence, even if, or an explanation is probably a better word, as to why he, you needed to use the black box facility. And I think the Assembly, whilst we would have questioned it, we would have accepted it uh, better than what we have had, because what we've had to do is basically wring it out of the minister and then wring it out of the department. And here we are today with the two main topics being the double accountancy piece, the amount of money allocated through the black box, uh, and you knew the issue with Northern Ireland Screen, but yet you, s you haven't sufficient information to answer the questions that have been put to the members on these issues. So that alarms me, because the Department of Finance is meant to have, as far as I understand, this overall monitoring role with regards to spend. Uh, so just some primitive questions on the black box. And I get the point where you were put in a position whereby you didn't know what department was going to have to burden. Uh, this financial sum. So you put the full amount into both. So are you saying that every time we get one of those big, thick manuals, the estimates, that they never add up? There is always that discrepancy within black box, albeit usually at 1.5 million. It's very unusual that there would be a situation where it isn't clear where there is going, which department is going to be responsible for uh, any amount of expenditure. The HIA and Victims and Survivors was unique in, in I, I'm not aware of anything ever happening like that where we were hit, your departments were hit with legislation. First of all, normally any legislation like that would have been brought through the assembly and therefore the departments themselves would have been the departments bringing the legislation that wasn't the case it was taken by the secretary of state through westminster and it was happening at a very late stage in the year but there wasn't the enacting legislation or secondary legislation to follow that so it, it, it in my experience i'm not aware of that situation ever anything like that having arisen before okay e even even on a smaller amount even even on the 1.5 allocation of the black box sphere? It, it, w it wouldn't normally, because no. normally <coughs> these would be brought... To, you know, okay, it would be the department would be coming to us and saying... Yeah. We're, we're, so so we're, given we're, the, the unique situation we were in, and given well, politically the support for the victims here in this regard, not to get political on this, because it's all about the accountancy as far as I'm concerned, why... But given it was such an exceptional case, why was it not highlighted by the department and hence the minister making us aware in the assembly floor? Why would you overlook something like that? Why would you leave it out? We, um, we were working on the basis that by applying the black box and the estimate, that in itself was highlighting that to the committee and to members. I take your point that that hasn't highlighted it sufficiently uh, and could I offer that if it would be helpful for the committee then uh, if in future whenever we're bringing an estimates mm. and a corresponding budget bill if as part of the briefing paper for the committee we were to list the black box items yeah yeah would, would that and uh, also well, an explanation of as exceeding uh, the 1.5 yes. million but, but but I take your point but, but what you did then was you created two evils if you like 
by the fact that you, you expanded the black box parameters to the point where as soon as we were to realize it, we were going to raise this as a red alert. Um, but not only that, putting in the full totals in both departments <coughs> looked to all of us as if it was just double accountancy and what, what is going on here with regards to the department, what are they trying to do? So, so one more point on that, and this may not be practical, but what, if you could have even split the total by half and put half in each department, would that have worked? It, it, the trouble with doing that is if, if then, whenever accounts were made, all of the, the provision fell to one department, that department would have had an excess vote B because, it, because the assembly sure. votes individual amounts for individual departments. Uh, no matter what way you'd split that, if, <coughs> if one department then ended up having to accept the full potential liability and therefore create the provision, that they, that department would then have exceeded its uh, control total that was voted by the Assembly and would have had an excess. And could you not fix that in a monitoring round? N no, no. It, it, it would require a, f a further and a statement of excess in a future budget bill that would then need to be, after, after the <coughs> accounting officer had, had uh, uh, or after it had been examined by the Northern Ireland Audit Office and the Public Accounts Committee. So, that, so would it have been better then? Can I, I, take, that ex I take that explanation 100%. I understand that. So would it then have been better to just have lumped f for one? Just best guess estimate, right? We, we probably, this sh if it was me doing it, I'd be putting in this department and put the whole lump into the one department and leave the other one bare. And, and ex the, unfortunately, exactly the same right situation anything. would have occurred yeah. then, because if, if any of that liability would have then sat with the other department, then likewise that department would have had an excess. But at that point, you're at a 50-50 chance of, of getting it right. But uh, if, if, if the accounting of this, if, without <coughs> naming the departments of no. for example, if department A and department B, and collectively we take a choice and say right we're going to we're going to seek all of the cover from the assembly for department a and we're not going to give any cover to department or ask the assembly to give the department b any cover and the permanent secretary accounting officer of department b says no oh, hold on i may have a potential future liability here i may need to create a provision uh, and you're, you're so going just, to, just and I, I am mindful sorry, of the lie, but sorry. To yeah, sorry. No, just, just, a, just a, a quick one because, I mean, and the clerk's quite rightly, and Jim's mentioned the business about qualification of accounts. But to go back to the point, is we have had we've had evidence here about training of accounting officers, and the permanent secretary or the accounting officers for the departments. So, at some stage or another, there must have been coordination between the permanent secretaries, all the accounting officers together where they must have looked at when they were looking at the supply, and they would have both recognised that they had two black boxes of exactly the same amount of money. At that point, why did the head of the civil service not bring them together and say, this needs to be sorted? We cannot have two black boxes of the same amount in two departments for the same amount of money. It's, it's back to the passage of the legislation through the Assembly that was required to deliver the service here. So that legislation hadn't actually commenced its journey. So to do to take that decision in advance of that was almost, as by Barry's point, giving one department an authority over another without the actual <coughs> debate happening. Well, why didn't the debate happen? This is the bit timing. where we're, getting, we're really confused the, the, here. Yeah, sorry. So, 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 that legislation has been and is continuing to still Go come through. forward. As it, it, in terms of the historical institutional abuse, I understand that it, it has done so now. Uh, and uh, my understanding is there the, the liability will, will sit with the executive office. In terms of victims and survivors, I think that's still going through and it's to go through later in, in May. Mm -hmm. So that, that is a process that is still happening. But we, we were in the situation back in February when we were writing the main estimates that that, that <coughs> hadn't happened. So can I, who wrote that legislation? Who, who had the authority to write to, to actually pin the executive office department to the liability? Well, there, there, was, two, there was the primary legislation was taken by the Secretary of State yes. in Westminster, but then the, the subsequent uh, legislation 
the enacting legislation was taken through the assembly. Yeah, so so obviously someone here wrote that. Mm -hmm. So surely there could have been an advanced decision where it's going to go, to as to yeah. where it was going to go months previous, and and would have helped you guys out in that regard. Absolutely. Oh, it, 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 believe, believe me, <laughs> no, there isn't there is nobody wish, wishes that that legislation had been written before the main estimates yes. more right. than me. Okay. <laughs> I, sorry. But, but it, it, yeah. You, the, yeah. Okay. it wasn't. John, thanks. Yeah. This is the first time I become aware of this concept. Like, uh, what is it called? Black box. Mm -hmm. But it seems to me there was a reasonable uh, explanation given here. It's this is not money that went missing. That's I think that's the point. Uh, you had to uh, put that money down because of the legislation in a certain manner, and that's what you don't. So it's not money that went missing, mm -hmm. Chip. No, no it's a, it, I think our, I think at least my concern, and I'm not speaking from the half of the department, is yeah. the fact that I'm perfectly understood that the money needed to be allocated somewhere. Yeah. But we allocated two lumps of the money in two different departments. It would be fine if we'd allocate it in one, yeah. and it's 1.5 million, Sean. That's that's the difference about it. Yeah. But I mean, the, 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 there is a there is a, a normal accountancy process for black box procedures and the rest of it for a mm. small delegated amount of budget, which would normally be. And the reason I think it's taken was when the delegated powers of the minister, which was about 1.1 million, which has grown by inflation to about 1.5, and I think that was one of the reasons why it was within the sort of criteria but for the black box. But at that point, uh, they didn't know which department was going to be responsible for the yeah. uptake on that. But there was the. I think the issue is it was 1.5 billion in two departments, mm. and that's that's the issue. I mean, it's it's overall uh, the accounting issue. Is it doesn't matter providing across the whole of the of the whole system, the money is accounted for, and I don't think anybody's disagreeing with that. Yeah. It's how it managed to be accounted for twice in the same, in two different departments. But all I'm saying is there was a reasonable explanation given here today in my mind. Okay, thank you. Uh, and just again to you uh, on the same point uh, that uh, whilst I can appreciate the confusion that would arise as a result of uh, using that instrument, uh, uh, i.e. the black box, uh, but you've already stated as well too that as far as um, the Treasury was concerned there was no confusion there, they knew exactly uh, the implications that offered. Uh, and, and accepting that, um, I do want to state as well too that I actually resent whenever we have even a member of uh, our committee here. Uh, talking about uh, wringing it out of the minister. It's like prejudicial language, and as much as that it implies that there was a cover up or something like it on the part of the minister. When we know, in fact, that that is not the case, not the case whatsoever. And again, I'd like to just place that on record. Thank you very much indeed. At least that has been taken. Uh, any other comments? Uh, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much indeed for a very educational. Thanks. Half an hour, and thank you very much indeed. And hopefully, we'll not see any more black boxes Don't ever not. again. Uh, well, you might I, say, I, I can't. I can't promise. That there won't, sorry, I can't promise that there won't be black boxes. Yeah. The black, the black we will box list them for you. We will certainly. Sure. Just don't, 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 don't. They, uh, <laughs> I can't promise there will not be any more black boxes, but just don't move them up. Thank you very much indeed. Oh, thank you, Dave. thank you, everybody. <laughs> And is jo Joanne, you still on the line? Thank okay. you, Joanne, anyhow. OK, ladies and gentlemen, if we move on fairly rapidly to finish off, and I apologise for running over time, but I think that was important. Uh, issues, uh, uh, agenda item number six, Chairman's Business. The National Crime Agency have got back to us and have given us a date of Tuesday the, tw or Tuesday the 12th of May. Yes, Do we sir. still wish to go ahead with that? Now, can we just outline some of the potential difficulties we have? Yeah, well, there, there is, first of all, the difficulty of the, the NCA coming over and, and getting room to accommodate everybody. They, they have offered to do teleconferencing, but again, that may create difficulties in getting room that will accommodate everybody as well, and it mightn't be ideal for, uh, for the committee. Uh, the other option is to postpone it uh, until a later date because it's uh, if Members consider it not to be essential business at this stage. Um, just, just through, just a point from the chair. Uh, William Humphreys is obviously the uh, liaisons committee chair. Has indicated that we should be concentrating as much as possible on issues that are directly related to COVID and COVID-related issues while this is going on. But 
do we need to temper that? And I'm open to everybody's views here. It's the fact that we've been spending a long time trying to get the NCA to communicate with us. So I, please, I'll take the views of. Of course, the key committee. issue, not NAMA originally. That they were coming here on NAMA, was it? Uh, yeah, that's what they are coming yeah. on. That's what they're coming for. Yeah. I don't think we should be deflecting it away from NAMA. That was the key issue. How many ones coming? No, Chair, it is, it is on NAMA that they were right. intending yep. to come. Right. Uh, I'm not sure. I think it's just one at this stage. Uh, as far as I know, it's possibly two. Uh, but it, it is NAMA, so it's, it's, it's a question of, of right. whether me members consider that to be essential business. The, the only comment I have, if I recall correctly, that's the day the Minister and the Permanent Secretary are coming about my bill. Mm -hmm. We saw today how timetabling runs away with itself. Sorry, Chair, it's, it's the 12th, it's a Tuesday. No, 12th, Which sorry. would make great difficulty in getting a room. Ah, sorry, sorry, I picked that up, up wrong. It's the 12th, not the whatever. The 13th of May is the meeting. Right. This, this was so it's an be sitting day. This is to be a confidential briefing. Uh, and uh, the NCA has agreed to do it through teleconferencing. Now. What time of the day were they doing that? Lunchtime. It's scheduled for 1pm. During the room lunch? Recess. Mm -hmm. well, I, th I, I think NAMA is an important issue. I think we should hear from them. Yeah, I, I think so. I think so too. Whilst I take the point that everything should be targeted towards the COVID-19 emergency, there, there are some things that are just too important. They're not necessarily essential, but they're just too important. Yes. And I think we need to keep going. Sure. I'm okay. Yes, uh, yes or no, sure. I'm going to yeah. Say. Um, well. Um, and I mean, this room. Are you saying uh, there's a problem with getting a room like this for that? Uh, well, it is. It's either room 29 or uh, room 30. I think it's room 29 that has there's been. Only, there's only one. There's only one person coming from them, or is there? A... I'm not sure, but I think it's only one. It's possibly two. But a. Uh... Prefer face to face if possible. Was it? I mean, that's only me saying it, but. Yeah. Yeah, I think yeah. just uh, just taking the signing of the committee, I think we would like to continue with that briefing. Yeah. Uh, sorry, are they still prepared to come over, or uh, would they yes, rather do it through telecom? So. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah, if they are prepared to come over, then I think we should. Yeah. Okay, if we can move on. I am sure there's. Uh... No, sorry, sorry. Okay. Uh, if we move on to seven correspondence. Uh, asking members to consider the following correspondence. Uh, Jim, you've asked for the correspondence from the Department of Justice to be included in this week's papers. Uh, do you wish to comment on that? Yes, there was a correspondence come in from the Permanent Secretary of Justice on my bill. Uh, why I got exercised about it was it was a total distortion of what the Section 5 of the um, Official Secrets Act says totally misrepresented what it said, and yet without any evaluation of it, it was sent to the Justice Committee, and I was questioning why that was done so preemptively. I might say I've written now to the Permanent Secretary in my terms, pointing out the error of his ways, but... Uh, you have already as the bill sponsor. I, I have, and I've, circu I've had a copy of that sent to the clerk, I believe. So that will be included in papers for next week's meeting? Yeah. yeah. Um, the other point I was making to the clerk about that was apparently it was sent to the Department of Justice because it dealt with the two clauses that have potential criminal offences. But I was pointing out that there were other representations I believe received that also comment on that, but they weren't sent. Mm -hmm. I was querying why we were being selective. And fundamentally, like, this is the committee handling the committee stage. So I was wondering why we were involving other committees at all. Should we seek clarification? And, Chair, it's, uh, it was the, the case of the Chairman that whenever it was decided which committee the bill would be referred to, that the Chairperson considered that each, chair, uh, each uh, committee would consider the clauses in the bill that were appropriate to that committee. Uh, it's normal practice whenever correspondence is received from a, a department other than your own that you would copy that correspondence to the committee concerned. Uh, I understood that members wanted to get this bill through yeah. as quickly as possible, so in order to try and expedite that, 
I, I suggested forwarding that to a uh, the Department for Justice in the same way that I would any other response to a committee that was referencing them. Okay. Can well, it's done, so there we have it. Um, I want to remind members, on the 24th of April, the committee was asked to forward a letter received from the Department of Justice regarding the function of government to the Committee of Justice to seek its views. The following members agreed, Paul, Gemma, Sean, Malaysia and Pat. A uh, formal agreement for the purpose of recording in the minutes to forward the response from the Department of Justice to the Committee of Justice. Agreed. Mm -hmm. um, if we move on to the Department's response to the call for evidence on the functioning of Government Bill tabled at page 112, advise members of the Department of Finance is responding on behalf of the Executive and deals with all clauses in the Bill. The responses will therefore be of interest to other relevant committees. I would like to seek your agreement to forward to the Committee for the Executive Office, Justice, Assembly and Executive Review Committee and Committee for Standards and Privileges. Are we content? Agreed. Agreed. I'd like to inform members all written submissions received in the call for evidence will be included for papers for next week's meeting, 6th of May. And at that stage, committee agreement will be sought to publish all submissions on the committee website. The Department will respond to the request for information on the guidance and process on COVID-19 regarding health and safety and social distancing as page 233. Do we have any comments, gentlemen? Uh, from the Committee of the Executive Office, a document setting out the reference on the new decade, new approach document at page 239. I advise members at page 247 the document references actions relating to the public sector's reform. Do we have any comments? I'd like you to seek agreement to include the correspondence again when the committee considers public sector reform as part of a strategic plan. Are we agreed? Agreed. Uh, from the Northern Ireland Leisure and Entertainment Forum regarding the current issues is page 267. Uh, would you like to comment? Pat, you probably want to say something. Yes, um, I, I did indeed. Uh, sure, thanks very much. Um, the, uh, the hospitality sector, they were, first, they were first to go into this recession and they're going to be last to come out of it. And uh, it's an opportunity, I think, anyhow, for us to set our stall out there with <coughs> the problems that's going to be facing this sector. Uh, it's going to be a lot longer than three months. All right. I mean, we sit in. I mean, social distancing. I, I can't see it working for that sector at all. And so this could go. Or this really could go on. It'd be great if we are able or in that position. But we're, we'll not be in that position. And I find that this. Uh, that's why I asked the question earlier on when we had the finance I mean, is there money, more money set aside in order to try and help us? Because I really do think that we're going probably some way to lose quite a lot of our businesses. We lost a lot of those public houses during the troubles. And it's the fabric of our society. It, you know, I, I genuinely believe uh, that it, it is the, on the hospitality side. It offers so much to us. And it's all right saying, but once they're gone, they're gone. Yeah. And it'll be very difficult for us to come back. And uh, really, we don't want to lose those jobs. You know, the, a lot of these are small family businesses. They're set out in rural communities. They are a lifeline within the rural community. They uh, outreach, and you know, I, I, I don't want to go on, but in my own time, they can cross gender and age, all of that. Uh, and we, we really don't want to lose it. But I also look at the at the price of the cost of licences, and for them. Uh, not to be protected or the risk of losing the money that is inbuilt in order to operate those businesses. I believe that the best way of selling alcohol is through that licence um, uh, pr pr proprietor, through the licence, the owner, uh, being there in a responsible situation. I'm just careful again, Chair, of, of losing this, and I think it's something that we, we, we should keep especially, I think, within this, this committee and looking at the money that's passed through finance in order to hold on to it. We already looked at the small money that's went out and the great work which has been done on the 10 and the £25,000 grant. And we look at the rates. Uh, the rates issue will come back to these businesses, but it would be nice if it was targeted in such a way as we can look at the businesses that are feeling themselves deeper into this recession and not able to come out of it as and when they want to or would like to. Yeah, thank Pat. Any other further comments? Yeah, I, I would agree with Pat. You know, the, 
this is going to be the hardest sector to get cranked up again. And also, even if we were allowed to open up again, there could be a consumer confidence issue with people not wanting to go out and mix and mingle. Uh, so I do think that the, the executive needs to, whatever recovery plan, I think this sector will have to be at the heart of it in a very practical way. And I think there could well be, there, there should be steps taken now. And what I mean by that is that they should be assessing whether they can open up any sectors of the leisure and entertainment and sporting sector. So golf clubs, uh, not actually the clubhouse, but the course itself. Can that be opened? Um, angling. Because as Pat says, these people, these, these businesses fulfil a role, and it's not only to sell drink and food, or it's, it's actually fitness, well-being, mental health. They all provide a service. So I think they'll, they'll, be, they'll become more important as people miss them. I know, I know golfers who are going up the walls because they can't get out and get around. So, so to me, there is things here that can be relaxed that may well help this sector get back on its feet again um, and get people mobilised again. Because if, I think that will add to the confidence uh, so that they can be confident when we can open our bars and restaurants again to go out and, and be entertained and, and, and be serviced in that regard. So, yeah, I think this is a massive issue. Now, what we do uh, about it as a committee, I don't know, but I think what we could do is write to write to the executive, or write to the, sorry, the finance minister, and, and, and I don't know if we can write to the OFM, DFM, but just basically well, say there is a, there is a proposal, uh, uh, Mr. Deputy, to write to the forum to inform them that this has been done and the committee will respond following an update from the department. And so, well, maybe we could seek agreement to write to the department to request that its response to the forum is copied to the committee and ask if there any specific measures being considered for further support for businesses within NAV, particularly where they were looking above 51,000K, and what considerations should be given to extending the rates holiday period beyond three months should the current lockdown continue beyond that period. So do I have your approval for that? Yeah, but, and that's the financial side of things, but I think then we need to talk, how, we need to be in a space, as you said earlier, Chair, where we talk about the recovery. Yeah. What does it look like? How do we open this up again? Yeah. And that's in a practical sense, and that's the best support you could probably give them, to actually allow them to open up and trade. But of course we're not there yet because the medical evidence is not there. Yeah. But when, when will it be? Yeah, so you know? oh. uh, Chair, that's an executive decision. Yeah, that's what that's what we were just saying. Yeah. 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 I, know. It's, I, I think from the finance aspects, we'll write on part yeah. of the finance. Yeah. But again, through our, our wider role as MLAs, we have the opportunity when the ad hoc committees are uh, making <coughs> representation. Uh, yeah. And take it on board what Sean has said it is, but it's in, we know that it's across every, this is across every department to try and get this economy up and going again. And this recession is deep, it's hurtful. It's not a recession, this pandemic, which has really stifled business. And we can be part of it because some of the spends that go out there that will lift us will be a large uh, infrastructure spends, which will be help, help it happening by government. We don't know what the spend is to the British government as well, or how they were intending to lift that prior to the pandemic uh, reaching across the, 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 the aisles. But we want to be part of the solution here, and I think it will be a collective uh, solution through all of us. All of us will have to be part of this, and just like that, uh, right across the executive. And it is an executive that is made up of all parties. It's an agreed executive, a shared executive, and we will want the best which is possible, and to be playing our part here as a finance committee to see that that money is well spent and spent strategically in order to get the biggest kick that we can and the biggest uptake for the economy. Okay, thanks very much, Sir Pat. Um, Just making another sorry. point on that as well, too, that uh, I have no doubt that everyone um, in every capacity um, are struggling to do the best uh, for all of our people and for our businesses and that as well. Uh, but I just would remind everyone as well too that yesterday in particular was very, very sobering, the statistics that were coming forward in terms of the this. number of people we are not out of this. who died 
and we're not out by any manner or means oh, and in that respect that we have to be uh, cautious uh, in the way we approach all of this and that the priority the priority at the end of the day back to our own health and well-being for all of our people yes indeed thank you very much um the next item on the agenda was a letter from the minister to hospitality also in relation to the impact of covid 19 in the hospitality sector dealt with, that, sir. Dealt with. yeah and we're content to note the remaining items of correspondence, are we, gentlemen? Yeah. Thank you. Uh, if we look quickly to the Forward Work Programme, and four members of the updated Forward Work Programme is page 284. I'd uh, also like to inform members of uh, uh, the letter tabled at page 127 from the chairperson of the chairperson's liaisons groups. Uh, you can read that and understand that what it is, but you've all seen it's always been circulated to all MLAs as well. I just want you to seek your agreement to, uh, to advise the Department that the focus of the Committee for Finance in the period ahead will obviously be on COVID-19 on COVID responses and other essential business, and that, as a result, non-essential business should be avoided if possible, which I think is quite clear. Content? Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I'd like to inform members that two SL1s have been received and are scheduled to be included in the meeting of 6 of May 2020. The rates coronavirus emergency relief regulations, Northern Ireland 2020, and the rate small business hereditament relief amendment regulations Northern Ireland 2020. Members, are we content to receive oral evidence on these two SL1s at the meeting on the 6th of May? Mm -hmm. Content. And are we content with the forward work programme as it now sits? Thank you. Yeah. Uh, do we have any other business? Sir, um, I was just looking down through d uh, different notes and I just had noticed a spend on legal fees. Uh, I wrote a letter off of myself just to ask for the, to the Department of Communities, but I just want to try and see where that four million pounds spent is. Uh, would we be would we be all right to try and get a breakdown to through the, the financial committee, or is it better that I just operate that on? Probably better do it through the Communities and as an MLA. Do it the Department of Communities part as an MLA. That's okay. And probably right to. Just, that's all right. That was I had probably right to Deirdre's private office and probably yeah. get a sort of a fairly swift response to that. So she's quite good. At those. Just a, a, that's fine. That's fine. Okay. Uh, thank you very much indeed, uh, okay. gentlemen. Thank you very much indeed. Please. And the data next meeting, 6th of May, uh, two thirty, in the Senate Chamber, and we'll be looking at our budget tomorrow. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much indeed, everybody. Thank Cheers. You. Thank you. Thanks. Fine. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed.